uh, she, I think, gave me the curiosity to look at the whole plant microbiome system from a bit of a larger perspective. Um, and that really got, got our curiosity going and uh, we had uh, some good success, good progress we made. And some of that I would like to bring forward to you. My background, as I said, is more in molecular stuff, but um, in the field of biological nitrogen fixation uh, during my PhD and even during my postgraduate studies. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. And I'll tell you, first of all, why this is so important, uh, both for the developed as well as the developing world. And uh, then I'll go on to tell you something about what the global efforts currently in research are to address this problem of uh, why we are interested in biological nitrogen fixation, how a number of different strategies we might think about how to improve things. Um, and then I'll go a little bit in the, in the detailed science uh, of what we found. I think we've made uh, a quite important discovery over the last three years, which we are chasing up. Uh, what I'll talk most about today from the scientific point of view. And uh, so let's get going. I think I can forward this here. So um, the title is Exploring and Exploiting Biofertilizing Biofilms. And it's, the novelty is in the biofilms. Uh, but let's give you some background. So this is my outline. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the nitrogen crisis, the possible biotech solutions, the state of the art, uh, bioengineering, with regards to bioengineering, enhanced diatotrophs, nitrogen-fixing biofilms, and the current challenges in the field. So we all know the world population is growing reasonably rapidly. It's supposed to be slowing down uh, end of the century, but uh, we are still looking at a rather high rate of fertility uh, in many countries. Uh, India has gone down, which is good. Uh, but the population will grow and the people are usually hungry. So how can we feed them all? We know about this topic and now we're stuck. Hmm. Okay. We also all know about the green revolution, uh, that high yielding crops, chemical fertilizers, machinery, and agrochemicals have massively increased the capacity to grow lots of food. But it's becoming increasingly clear that uh, we cannot keep up with the pace of intensifying agricultural practices with the world population. So the gap between the population growth and the amount of fertilizers uh, isn't matching up anymore, so hence our problem of food security. And the topic we'll be talking about is nitrogen fixation. So usually before the Green Revolution, all nitrogen was derived from bacteria that can produce nit nitrogen or reduce nitrogen, uh, which is the form that can be made available for, for plant growth and everybody's growth. So with the invention of the Haber-Bosch process, nitrogen fertilizers could be produced chemically. Uh, the process is highly energy costly. It consumes about two to three percent of the world's fossil energy. Um, due to the high temperature and pressures that are needed to produce nitrogen fertilizers. Another problem is, of course, the runoff of over-fertilized lands into waterways, uh, resulting in algal blooms and other aquatic systems. And it's stuck again. And also leading to coastal death zones. And uh, those are largely concentrated around the coasts of the most industrialized countries, Europe, the US, and Japan, 
but as we'll see soon, uh, these coastal death zones are now also developing around India um, and around the world really, and it's really starting to be quite worrying. And then there is of course a contribution of the application, production and application of nitrogen fertilizers with regards to uh, global warming. Uh, the excess reduced ammonium in the soils are converted via denitrification more rapidly back into uh, either dinitrogen but also into nitrous oxides. And nitrous oxides are, of course, a very potent greenhouse gas. And they are estimated that about 6 to 7 percent of all greenhouse gas contribution to global warming is due to nitrogen fertilizers, to the excess use of nitrogen fertilizers, I might add. So, and of course, this led then for UN and other calls for a sustainable intensification of agriculture. The problem being that yields need to be increased without adverse environmental impacts and without the cultivation of more land. Because uh, most arable land on, on the earth is already being used up for agriculture, so uh, we don't necessarily want to chop down the Amazon forest, for example, to get more arable land. Um, and there's an interesting study in Nature and then followed up in Science recently. Uh, where they looked at the major ecological challenges for human development in the world. And what was striking here is that the imbalances we've introduced into the global nitrogen cycle uh, were deemed a more prominent problem, and largely so, than climate change itself. And just be, be uh, on second place behind uh, loss of biodiversity. So this is a perhaps much more acute problem than global warming, although global warming is a big one too, of course, and those two are interlinked. And in what relation does that stand with development? And uh, the director of the OECD gave a very pertinent speech, if I can link this. We got Wi-Fi here? The video is online on YouTube. It's online on YouTube, yeah. I think, sir, uh, YouTube is actually not uh, supported as it is a social uh, entertainment platform, so it is not supported on local networks. Oh, okay, okay. Is YouTube is not supported. Yeah, YouTube. Yeah. Universally blocked is YouTube. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we'll just skip it then. So, so uh, the main message is that uh, when you think about nitrous oxide, which is, or other particulate that forms due to over fertilization of, um, of lands, of agricultural lands, uh, the health cost in the developed world due to pollution resulting in respiratory problems, oh yeah, uh, is estimated at two trillion uh, dollars per year. The health costs associated with over pollution, I mean, when you look, for example, in Delhi, you know, you've got a lot of smog and people are, are getting less healthy. Uh, in the, develop, the developing world is considered to be three trillion dollars 
per year. So that aspect alone, I think, justifies what we're trying to do, even though it's a, an enormous challenge. So what are the solutions to the nitrogen crisis? And I'm glad again to be here in uh, Gujarat because one of the most effective solutions would all to become more Indian and eat vegetarian. Much of the problems associated with nitrogen in the global cycle are associated with the production of meat. So if we all become vegetarian, then the world would be a much happier place, a better place, and I would be out of a job. But never mind. Uh, <laughs> so, what are the solutions with regards to biotechnology to the nitrogen crisis? And there are several leading strategies. So this is just to remind you what biological nitrogen fixation is. If you have biological nitrogen fixation, this is a legume. You can either use chemical fertilizers as on the, on the left, you have a healthy, good growing plant. Then you can have synthetic, uh, sym symbiotic nitrogen fixation in the middle, you have a healthy plant. And you don't have either, and then uh, plants don't grow. So it's just to illustrate the importance of nitrogen for plant growth. Now, for most crops, we cannot have biological nitrogen fixation in symbiosis. It only works for a few select ones, like chickpea or other pulses, but not for wheat, barley, rice, corn, uh, and all the others, staple crops. So the biology of, which one is, oh, this one's working. So with regards to the ecology of biological nitrogen fixation systems, we have, we distinguished three, three different ones. So either the one I've just showed you, where rhizobia go into a very intimate symbiosis with the plant system, and uh, this is believed to be the most efficient biological nitrogen fix fixation on the planet. Then we have the second one where the bacteria associate, usually with the outside of the plant root, uh, where the bacteria represented in red dots will fix nitrogen, and some of the nitrogen is believed or will then benefit the plant growth. And then we have the third one, which are the free living ones, where bacteria just do it for themselves. Basically, they have this trait in order to produce their own biomass. And it's also supposed to enrich the soil somewhat for plant growth. So what are the main strategies? One is to engineer the plant. Uh, for example, on the left-hand side, current efforts concentrate um, to transfer nitrogen fixing capacity into plant chloroplasts or mitochondria. Mm. And this type of research is mainly led by Luis Rubio in Madrid. And I must say they're, they're making uh, very good progress. They've shown that they can express some of the nitrogenase genes in, in the mitochondria uh, and they seem to be functional, but it's still a long way to go. The second major strategy is to engineer plants to, to engineer plants to go into symbiosis. So we're talking about wheat, where you try to um, gene edit the plant to form root nodules, just like a legume crop would. And that is mainly led by uh, Giles Aldroyd in Cambridge. And then there is a biotechnology approach that looks at the bacteria and not at the plant. And here, efforts are already being applied on the field, in India, for instance. And uh, 
then there's a more high-tech approach where you try to engineer the bacteria in such a way that they either produce more ammonium from nitrogen um, or that they share more of their produced nitrogen to the plant. And uh, this is what we have been doing over the past few years. And there's a number of different uh, strategies as well, but I don't want to go into it in too much detail. Um, so when we think about inoculants, uh, we all know that uh, plant, the bacteria have a lot of plant growth promoting traits, one of, only one of them being nitrogen fixation. And uh, companies are already producing different mixtures of inocula and then uh, sell them to the farmer so they can apply them to, 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 to their crop. And um, with, with good results, they usually enhance plant growth, but they're very varied. And the way they function, we hardly understand. Uh, but what you will find in most inoculants is the presence of some diazotroph, some nitrogen fixer. And then how are they applied? They usually then, seeds are often coated with those inocula. Uh, either they can be done reasonably low-tech locally or high-tech if you think of bio, uh, bio for instance. And That leads me to the question, um, can we feed the world population with current nitrogen biofertilizers, with these kind of inoculants? And I know that most, or a lot of the students here, work on these formulations. And they have been applied globally, everywhere. Um, what I, when I go to conferences, what I find is that yes, they help, and to 10 to 15 percent. But I want to perhaps ask a hard question: Will that be enough, given the world growth in population? I do not know that. But um, at least the good thing is we have a starting point. We have something that works a little bit. I think we have to think afresh of how can we build on that. And how can we go further? Um, I personally don't think with current knowledge and practices, it is enough. And we will also always face the competition of chemical nitrogen fertilizers, which obviously produce much more than like organic farming. And that's a shortcoming uh, I hope to contribute to overcome. So. The challenges in that regard seems to me to make the diazotrophs either more efficient biofertilizers. Um, one of the challenges that until now was seen as a major challenge is the oxygen, because most nitrogen fixing organisms cannot fix nitrogen under ambient oxygen. And Another one is if you apply those formulations onto the seed or onto the soil, uh, they usually face fierce um, competition. How, how can we make them stay longer on the root? How can we make them beneficial longer, hopefully over an entire crop cycle? So just a diagram to show the two major nitrogen processes occurring in the cell, one in the diatotrophic cell, one is nitrogen fixation, so that determines the rate by which atmospheric nitrogen is converted, converted by reduction into ammonia, we all depend on. And then there's a second factor, it's, it's the consumption rate, because diatotrophs do that in order to grow. So that is the rate by which ammonium is then assimilated into biomass. So 
one idea is, of course, and it's not it's an old idea. If if you are, you could either need to incre increase the production rate, or you have to reduce the consumption rate, if you want to produce surplus ammonium, that could then be given to the plant. It's a really simple idea, and there's a lot of papers out there who have, for example, shown that if you reduce the rate of nitrogen assimilation, that your bacteria will excrete ammonium, or if you overexpress the genes coding for the nitrogenase, then you will also produce surplus ammonium. So a few years ago, uh, we, we were building on this concept and wanted to apply some synthetic biology approaches to uh, tune this uh, economy, if you like. And uh, let me start on the right bottom where it says pentrogenase. So we know the reaction it catalyzes. Oxygen destroys the nitrogenase. But when the ammonium that is being produced is then readily fed into this nitrogen assimilation pathway uh, via a few intermediates, so it takes the Krebs cycle intermediate alpha ketoglutarate, it then emanates it into glutamate and then into glutamine. And the amount of glutamine in relation to the amount of alpha ketoglutarate will then feed into this regulatory cycle whereby nitrogen assimilation is first turned on. So if a cell experiences uh, nitrogen deficiency, it will start to switch on genes in nitrogen assimilation. The idea is that it increases the rate or the efficiency of the nitrogen that is available into, into growth, into biomass formation. And then if that fails <coughs> at a later stage, uh, they will start to produce a nitrogenase, which is a very costly decision for the cells to make. About 30% of the total protein of a, of a diatrophic cell can be the nitrogenase. That is simply because the nitrogenase is very inefficient and it's low enzyme. So uh, you need a lot. And then you produce nitrogen again and once you have enough you stop via this regulatory circuit and that is one of the problem of course if you want to apply nitrogen diisotrophs to the soil there's a challenge with regards to okay if you also then fertilize it your diisotroph will not do much because it's happy with its nitrogenous economy <coughs> so how, the idea was how do we make the cells blind to their own nitrogen needs so we can coax them into producing, thinking we, we need some and then produce some. That was a simple idea. Uh, this just shows you one example which I, which I find highly, highly promising. Uh, that's, a di that's from a different lab, that's from the... Zusa lab in, in Brazil, they do fantastic work. So it's just to show you that in principle, the bacteria we're working with, the nitrogen fixers, they can have the capacity to produce most of the nitrogen that is needed for normal plant growth compared to a chemical fertilized plant, which you see here on the right, on the left. So the left plant is fertilized with uh, ammonium, sufficient ammonium. And on the right you see a mutant strain which is deficient in nitrogen assimilation. So that strain can produce up to 70% of the maximum growth achieved using nitrogen fertilizers. And when you compare that to what you often see in the field, say 10%, 12 if you're lucky, of growth enhancements, it's not the biochemical deficiency of the diatotrophs that are limiting. This is why I think the limiting factor is really the competition in the ground or, or they keel over after some time. 
So what we did is when you think of a cell which senses low nitrogen, it will then via this NTIB, NTSC signaling pathway, those are the bacteria two component system, <coughs> will then switch on uh, the genes necessary for nitrogen assimilation. And if that then fails, it'll switch, switch on nitrogen fixation. So the simple idea was we rewire the cellular signaling system using a homologous system and then we get rid of the native signaling system, use our synthetic one, and then we can <coughs> control the expression of about 50 genes in the cell via the synthetic system. And this is just how it works. So we have two control levels for our synthetic transcription system. On the right, you can see we can drive the transcription of nitrogen assimilation genes either by uh, just expressing more of the synthetic system, but also by regulating it via a non-native signaling system, in this case Arabinose, so we can control the system. I don't want to, I spoke last time about that, I don't want to hang on about that, but basically we can regulate nitrogen assimilation and nitrogen fixation to some degree independent of the nitrogen status of the cell and then see how much ammonium is surplus produced. And this is just the control that we have good control over nitrogen assimilation in this case when nitrogen is present where the native system is off. I don't want to go into too much detail here. I want to tell you about an observation which was very surprising to us and was contrary to um, textbook knowledge. Um, and we made that about two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, we were constructing some report or transcription transporter strain, so we took the, the NIF promoter, NIF-H promoter, which is one of the strongest promoter of <coughs> nitrogenase. And then we hooked up to it a few reporter constructs like GFP uh, <coughs> or beta-galactosidase. So we could then use these constructs in Klebsiella, in which we work mainly, to measure how much expression under different condi conditions occurs and so forth. So during this uh, construction, we were quite surprised that after a few days, we get a positive signal. What was that due to that positive signal? Usually you think Klebsiella in air, like on a plate or on a batch culture. I don't know, is there a lot of uh, nitrogen batch culture, nitrogen fixation batch culture you do in the lab here? You know, when you just grow your cells? Um, so that was then quite surprising, how can if we are working in air? And when we saw that, uh, we were quite excited. And then uh, I was reminded of some of the results Schroeder had produced in a previous paper, where we looked at the colonization of Klebsiella strains on plant roots. Uh, which doesn't come, uh, I'll show that, hold on, I'll just show that, Oops. yeah, I mean that's from a paper, where we observe, observe, so in red you have the plant roots, plant hairs, and um, root hairs, and uh, in green you have uh, GFP tagged Klebsiella. Uh, so what was impressive here, you know, they seem to cluster around and we often saw them on the root hair. So <clears throat> when, when we saw that our Klebsiella grown on a plate for a few days seemed to express the opposite of the root, seemed to express a nitrogenase, we thought, hang on, uh, do they really fix, could they even fix nitrogen? Oops. 
And when you think of a biofilm, uh, we did up some reading, if you think of a biofilm, which is usually, at least in the medical field, uh, considered a nightmare, uh, because it leads to persistence in hospitals uh, and so forth. But uh, biofilm is basically um, a structured community of bacteria, often containing a, a lot of different bacteria. Uh, but if you, if you grow a biofilm, so E. coli or any other strain, you usually have this differentiation in function between the different bacteria, between the same bacteria in, in the different strata of, of the biofilm. Uh, it depends on what kind of bacteria you're talking about. Gram-negative behaves differently to gram-positive, but in the gram-negative, gram such as in Klebsiella uh, or E. coli, we know what we know from E. coli, you usually have three layers, especially when you grow them on a biotic surface, where the outer layer is usually metabolically little active. It serves as a barrier, if you like. Then in the middle phase you have metabolic activity and on the on, on the little we know about the the, the the phase that is closest to the nutrient surface <clears throat> and all this is of course held together by EPS by extracellular po uh, polymeric um, substances and we thought okay and we know also in gram-negative biofilms that the oxygen from the outer layer inwards drops the oxygen pressure. And so putting those two together, we thought, oh, that we could be onto something here. So here we measured directly the acetylene reduction of a biofilm. And what you see under nitrogen rich conditions on the top left, you see uh, we have no acetylene reduction at all. Acetylene reduction measures the activity of the nitrogenase in a cell. However, under nitrogen poor con conditions, uh, we saw quite robust acetylene reduction. Uh, so these are biofilms. You just grow them on a plate and then you do the uh, acetylene reduction. You just have to do it, obviously, in an airtight container. Uh, and the same is shown again on the right. And why, while we have two strains, we work with M5A1, which is a model strain, laboratory strain, uh, which isn't very good for nitrogen fixation, but people have been working with it for 30 or 40 years, so we stick to that, and the, the genetics is very well understood. Uh, and then we work with uh, our superbug, SGM81, uh, that's a strain that Schroeder brought to the lab uh, and we are very interested in. And as you can see, SGM is perform, outperforming uh, M5A1 uh, by about 20 or so. So uh, that was very promising indeed. This is basically showing the same, uh, just using a transcription mm -hmm. assay to show that the nitrogenase mm -hmm. is being uh, switched on. So you have the requirements for expressing the nitrogenase and nitrogenase activity. In this case, is really, uh, it has to be poor in nitrogen. It won't happen under nitrogen-rich conditions. And this is what we need, ultimately, in order to make surplus-producing diazotrophs for agriculture. Uh, and in case of the biofilm, oxygen doesn't matter. And that is excellent news. Uh, this is just to, to confirm this a bit further. So on the left you see uh, two panes. The, other, the top one is confocal microscopy of NIF expression in, in the biofilm. So if you think of a colony on a plate, if you, it will grow into some kind of biofilm usually. Uh, you look at it from the top and you can see that in the middle there is a disc, the grey one here, which expresses the nitrogenase. Now the more interesting view is that from the side, where you have this 
grey or illuminated block in the middle of the biofilm. So it seems to be really the both extremities of the biofilm, if you look through the Z-plane, that there is a middle layer which is highly active in re reducing nitrogen to ammonia. And on the right you see uh, a TOFSIMS image along the Z-plane. So TOFSIMS is a mass spec based methodology where you ionize uh, your, your sample and then you measure how much nitrogen or what ions are present in that. And what we did here, we grew our, our biofilm first on 15N so that all the nitrogen atoms in our bacteria are heavy labeled. And then we just put them into air. So any N4, N, um, N14 that we can find in our sample will be from atmospheric nitrogen. It cannot be otherwise. So in doing so, we found that if we drill through our biofilm with our ion beam, going deeper and deep, deeper into the biofilm, you can see that at the first, in the first part of our biofilm, uh, the black line is at zero. And then as we go deeper, all of a sudden you see this first thing. Uh, <coughs> 14N, which indicates nitrogen, where nitrogen fixation occurs. So all that uh, was to confirm that nitrogen fixation happens in biofilms. And that's not only important for the purposes we are looking at about nitrogen fixation to enhance uh, crop growth. It's, of course, also very important for the medical field because... Uh, Often people think, why, why do we, um, why are medically important biofilms still growing in adverse environments? And for example, there's a lot of uh, co or yeah, co biofilms, especially in the lung. If you think of Pseudomonas pneumonia, in together with. Um, uh, what is it, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, that cause huge problems. And uh, some people think that perhaps the nitrogen from the nitrogen fixer, Clepsula pneumonia, could sustain the life of other um, important bugs involved in lung or other infections. And these two are oddly very often paired in medical samples of wounds. So we will look into that as well. But uh, let's concentrate on the plants. So we know that we have macro colonies, biofilms, whatever you want to call them, on, on the root hair. And um, we wanted to know what kind of proportion of those cells in, the, in biofilms grown on roots this time, because we've seen we can do that, uh, are actually fixing nitrogen. So we grow biofilm on a root under nitrogen staffed conditions and then we wash off, wash off our bacteria from the roots and then we do a, a method called RNA fish where you hybridize the messenger RNA with the fluorescent samples and wherever it lights up red in this case uh, we were looking for genes being expressed in nitrogen assimilation and the green ones are expressing the nitrogenase. So uh, we found, as you often do, a lot of heterogeneity. So the, the green blobs on the right uh, are cells that are strongly expressing the nitrogenase. The ones uh, red, they are assimilating nitrogen or expressing genes that are involved in that. And you can see that about, in this particular case, what is it, 60-70% perhaps, seem to be green and that's what we want. So there's a large proportion within this particular biofilm, which in this case has been grown for seven days, uh, on the plant is fixing nitrogen. And uh, we can also look at the expression of the nitrogenase in the biofilms compared to other uh, proteins in the cell. What we find, this is basically just, just to show that if you look at the incorporation of nitrogen fixed 
of atmospheric nitrogen fixed in those cells uh, for the NIF H, D, and K samples, uh, which are the nitrogenase, uh, we have a high percentage already after three days which have been built, whereas other proteins not directly involved in nitrogen fixation lag behind after three days. So what that really just shows is that the establishment of nitrogen fixation via expression of nitrogenase on plant, on, on biofilms, is the priority for the cells. Um, because otherwise you wouldn't produce the nitrogenase uh, exclusively. So all the nitrogen you fix is directly converted into producing more nitrogenase. And um, <clears throat> another interesting example I briefly want to show is, um, is really how different batch cultures are from biofilms. I mean, most of our knowledge from, from, from the lab and nitrogen fixation has all been done in batch culture. And I think we have to rethink that. We have to really think about the ecology they are living in. I know it's difficult, and that's why it's so little understood, I believe. Because it happens in the dark, it happens in the soil, and uh, to establish new methodologies to study what the actual relevant biology is, is not going to be easy. But we're working with others to try to enhance that. We're working with uh, plants on ships, for example, Firat was here, if you had the chance to listen to him. Um, and uh, so we have to think of new ways of studying it. It's going to be complex. But I think we are making some headway in that regard. So here, what I just want to show you, uh, what we can do is we can measure the concentration of the proteins within a culture to, to high accuracy. We're using again a mass spec based approach, multiple reaction monitoring mass spec. And uh, one of the postdocs, Chris, in, in the lab has developed a, a neat little uh, essay whereby you you look at how much N14, again as before, is incorporated into each protein. And you can really count over time uh, <coughs> the mass decrease in this case as atmospheric nitrogen is increased. So, um, Here you have uh, the heaviest species of this particular peptide derived from the protein. And then over, <coughs> over the period of 24 hours, you can see this going away to the lighter form. So this is the N14 only peptide. So it shows you really the, the, uh, the building of a protein in real time of a certain step point. And interestingly, in batch culture, you can get that touch Batch, is it touch screen? Okay. That's fine. It won't disturb now. It won't disturb now. Okay, okay. Uh, can I use this pointer? Uh, pointer? No. Okay. Um, you can use the mouse if you want to point out that you can use mouse from there. Okay, okay. Ah, that's what I need. Um, so here you see that over time there's a progression towards the lighter form of the protein, indicating that it's derived entirely from fixed nitrogen. If you do the same experiment in biofilms, you will find that the distribution of the protein species. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the mouse is fine, thank you. Uh, that the distribution of the heavy and light species is distinct. So we have one population of cells who are not fixing nitrogen and have therefore still the fully heavily labeled uh, species of the glutamine synthetase. And we have a, a subpopulation that has entirely uh, light proteins that derive from nitrogen fixation. So it really reinfirms just the, the, the fact what I showed earlier that a proportion of the biofilm cells 
are nitrogen fixing and doing so efficiently. And what we're doing currently, we are, we are looking at the best biofilms that we can study and that hopefully will produce uh, plant growth. Um, we are looking at different plants and different crops. Uh, at the beginning we were fiddling around with Arabidopsis, but it's for this instance, it's it's a really, <laughs> yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> um, uh, but we're looking, for example, at wheat and barley and uh, and other things, and I think there's some 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 promising results we've obtained there as well. And I think Sheetal will perhaps talk a little bit about that tomorrow. And uh, that's really uh, just to summarize what we're currently chasing up on. So we're concentrating on biofilm. We've uh, we've made the proof of principle that it works, that we have a new biology of nitrogen fixation to look at, and uh, we are trying out how we can exploit that for for sustained biofertilization in the crops. And I think this is just to to thank the people who were involved in the project. Obviously, Shwada was here. I don't have a picture from Sheetal, but you can look at her in life. Um, then uh, Christoph Wade, a long-time postdoc in the lab, excellent bloke, doing fantastic work. We also do other things like systems, integrative systems biology, where we look at the heterogeneity of uh, nitrogen fixation with, with, with Rowan. And uh, this is a very talented PhD. We currently have two files uh, who was in the lab for a couple of years, but has now sadly left. Um, he's from India, um, and uh, my mentor uh, and former head of department, Martin Buck. Thank you. Pardon my ignorance. Yes. But what is coastal dead zones? Coastal dead zones, you would have seen it's uh, basically uh, if you over fertilize the land, think about the Midwest. Then it rains, it washes off into the river, and then it leaves the coastal zone. And what happens then? Process of eutrophication. So you over fertilize the seawater, which then first leads to, say, algae bloom. So they love it. Mm -hmm. You've got lots of nitrogen, you can grow like crazy. So by doing so, they will consume all the oxygen in the coastal zones. And then often what you have. Yeah, you only have that fish washing up because they need more uh, the, 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 the oxygen. And uh, yeah, then basically the um, whole local fisheries are dead. It was in the, in the video. I, I can't I can't oh. pinpoint it, but I'll get it to you. Okay. Because it's in the, the OECD data data. <coughs> Well, India is a bit luckier because it's uh, in the sense that it can't afford so many natural fertilizers. But they are developing uh, and they're developing quite fast. Uh, I'll get you the OECD. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, the test that you have done, pot culture studies, whether there are actually pot culture studies that you have shown, some of the pictures. Yeah. So, whether they have done, you are using the field soil or uh, some kind of a sterile soil? It's, I, th I think it's a bit of a mix. Um, um, currently, what we're doing in Peru is mainly still sterile. Uh, because one of the things to, to test is, of course, if it's non sterile, so there's competition as well. I think my hope is that the biofilm will protect Clapsia, I say, from. Because my person, say for example, mycorrhiza and this nitrogen fixing genes, they are not factors in the mix factors. Both are related, right? 
Yes. 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 So that's what. Because in our, we have published in environmental microbiome. I worked with Roger Finley from Swedish University of Agriculture. Okay, okay. Uh, so what we have done is that we have gone through different horizons and we could clearly see that the mycorrhiza has a different microbial communities in different horizons. Okay, okay. The mycorrhiza was different and the associated bacterial communities were also different. Okay, okay. And that was in sterile or non sterile? It is in uh, non sterile soil. Okay. It's from the forest soil. Okay, okay. So I was uh, thinking whether here I, also it could. Uh, that's that's um, that's a great thought, and uh, you know the thing of trying to combine mycorrhizal with nitrogen <laughs> fixing uh, <laughs> biofilms is perfect. I'm. Uh, it's probably in part due to both. <laughs> ignorance and my uh, skepticism. I think we should try that. Uh, but I have a problem with, well, I'm, I don't have a problem with, but uh, you know, all the studies where they do the microbiome of this plant and that plant, um, I think you have to limit it to a few. I don't know what you can actually conclude when you look at massive complex systems. Yes, you can say we've got so many of them, so many yes. of those. Uh, from a biotechnology point of view, when you want to perhaps engineer something or do something from bottom up, I think it's too complex. I, I don't know, I'm, you might have a different opinion, but, but that's at least from my brain limitations. Uh, it's too complex for me. We used to have the same kind of discussion with Sarah Haley. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's right. But everybody can do whatever they want. <laughs> uh, but, um, I mean, if we had a two, two species yeah. association, mycorrhiza, Pepsiana, or whichever one, that would be interesting. But I'd like to, to, to that you give me that paper, or perhaps you can tell me a little bit more about it. It is in uh, 2017 environmental microbiology. Okay, good. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, you have used this pot culture and this soil. soil. <coughs> so, how you will come to know that uh, whatever the, you have inoculated in this soil is the same uh, same organism is working or not? Um, after a period of time. Mm -hmm. Have you check? Have you checked it that uh, your organism is working? Working in doing what? Fixing nitrogen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, those biofilms, perhaps one of those plants or another plant. So we grow a biofilm, we put the plant to an acetylene reduction, and it fixes nitrogen very well. Now, there is, there, there is a no contamination from the air or something like that? No, no, absolutely no. not. Okay. Um, but no, that, that, that we are very certain of uh, because we made a mutant with a NIF minus um, trait. We're not talking with age say to get the same essay because some some of the criticism that came against previous papers <coughs> has always been uh, when you do acetylene reduction with plants when you um, when you hurt the roots the natural response of the plants produce acetylene exactly the same molecule you measure <laughs> so that has always been a criticism. But uh, by knocking out the NIF genes and doing the same experiment, so treating the plants exactly the same way, the nitrogen fix off its nitrogen and the mines didn't. So that that's, gives us extra confidence that it's really important on the plant. But uh, when you are going to use this in the field, so that this, uh, they, they will fix the nitrogen as in a strong condition they are fixing? We don't know that yet. Um, that's what we're working on, and that's why this collaboration is also so important. Uh, because in the middle of London, we cannot do many plant experiments. Um, but uh, <coughs> whether it's working, we'll, we'll have to see. We've just sent off the first samples in a trial where we grew the biofilm, and then we sent it off to the States to get some um, uh, to, to measure incorporation of isotopically labeled. Uh, nitrogen into plant tissue. 
but we haven't got the results back. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's just the first step, but that would provide proof of principle that it could work. And then whether it works in what soil, under what conditions, all that needs still to be done. Uh, but at least I think it's a, it's a good way forward. And also what we need to do, we need to do perhaps do a bit longer with our growth experiments and then see that our biofilm is still intact and working. It was mainly just proof of principle at this point. One thing I have to add to that paper, we have also checked in high amount of nitrogen and in uh, without nitrogen. Okay. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was interesting. So you can refer that paper. We do clearly see that the communities have also ch changed. The okay. micro, its association changed, and even the dominant ectomycorrhiza have also changed. We have used three different nitrogen levels. Okay. So it was a microcosm experiment, and we could see that in all the three, uh, three different uh, levels of nitrogen, both bacterial communities and uh, as well as ectomycorrhiza, has completely. Of course, it is in three layers: O, E, B, soil horizon. We have okay. three. Soil horizon, and I have done this thing. Okay. Okay. So that's what I was. Is there a correlation about. between uh, nitrogen fixed as in the nitrogen? And as well as yes. Okay. So yeah. that's what. Okay. Well, uh, we know all about the NPR expression. What is the NPR expression? Pardon? The NPR expression. You have mentioned in one slide. What is the NPR expression? And okay. NPR is. Yes, uh, you know. The gene expression that is responsible for the identification. Uh, no, um, the NTR expression is nitrogen assimilation. Because those two systems are coupled. They are very interdependent if you like. But the, on the hierarchy, NTR is higher. NTR switches on when nitrogen becomes low. So the first response of the cell is to assimilate nitrogen. It does it by nitrogen scavenging, for instance. A lot of transporters for, for different amino acids are switched on. So, you know, senses, oh, I need nitrogen. And then it tries to pump in as much nitrogen as there's in the environment. If that fails, the second step kicks in, which is nitrogen fixation. So, we, we, because we're interested in the regulatory system that's involved, we study both nitrogen assimilation and nitrogen fixation. So it's directly correlated. Uh, it's directly correlated. Not correlated. Um, in, in a way, yes. But you have to think about the system as a hierarchy. Uh, so we, because on, on the on a fish experiment, you saw that some some cells they were assimilating nitrogen. You know the red dots. Whereas some were only fixing. I, th I think that's really, uh, with regards to the decision making within the cell, at the beginning you do only assimilation. It's not cost. Okay. And if that fails, you fix. But you, you don't assimilate. So they are definitely linked with regards to their regulation on different, on several levels, but they do not necessarily correlate. At one point, yet, I, I would probably think we would always have first an assimilation and then extension. I think, keeping pace with the time, we are going to conclude this session. The organizers are much thankful to George Sumaka for delivering such an interesting and informative keynote address on nitrogen assimilation, fixation, and solving the problem of food of the globe. So I offer uh, the memento. Oh, thank you so much. So once again, thank you, Sumaika. Now we'll move to the next speaker.
let me welcome professor anil prakash sir So let us welcome Professor Anil Prakash. Professor Anil Prakash is a former dean, faculty of life sciences, and head department of microbiology, Bharatpur University, Bhopal. He is ex-director, department of pharmacy. He is coordinator, DBT builder program, Madhya Pradesh Council of Science and Technology. He is chairman, board of science in microbiology of Bharatpur University, Bhopal. I welcome you, sir, on behalf of organizing committee, and. I welcome you to have your presentation here. And now I think I think it's good afternoon to all of you. So, after very informative and lecture of Dr. George on nitrogen fixation and regarding the how to combat with the food. So, my, today's my lecture is also related with some about the how to, because to increase the productivity, because the, as we know very well that uh, the, nowadays is climate change is very having some impact on our cropping system. So, in that, that way, way, I have, sorry, in first lecture we have used the nitrogen, that is a biological fixation, and when we use the chemical fertilizer, that is nitrogen, urea, it is also very problematic when we use the chemical fertilizer because uh, the farmers they are using urea too much. They don't know how much amount of the urea they have to use in the field because they want productivity more and more. So that's why they are putting more urea in their field. They don't know how much plant will take it. So, the purpose of that, my today's topic is that, because we are also working on that line, that okay, how to minimize the chemical biofertilizer, means chemical fertilizer, not biofertilizer, and use of biofertilizer. So, in that way, we have isolated number of 
माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिजम्स विच आर रिजाइडिंग इन साइड द प्लांट दैट इज कॉल्ड द एंडोफाइट्स दे आर सो मैनी एंडोफाइट्स वी हैव आइसोलेटेड फ्रॉम पर्टिकुलरली फ्रॉम द मेडिसिनल प्लांट्स एंड ऑल्सो फ्रॉम द राइजोस्फेरिक सॉइल ऑफ द सोयाबीन एंड व्हीट एंड अदर क्रॉप्स सो इन दैट केस वी हैव आइसोलेटेड नंबर ऑफ माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिजम एंड वी स्क्रूटनाइज वी कैन स्क्रीन दैम फॉर द पर्पज ऑफ दैट वी विल दे आर प्रोड्यूसिंग शोइंग सम प्लांट ग्रोथ प्रोमोटिंग प्रॉपर्टीज लाइक एन आई इंडोल एसिटिक एसिड फॉस्फेट सोलिबलाइजेशन एंड सो ऑन सो ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ दैट एंड पर्टिकुलरली ऑल्सो वी आर लुकिंग फॉर द बायो कंट्रोल पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू बिकॉज विज दीज माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिजम दो जो आर प्रोड्यूसिंग सम मेटाबोलाइट दे आर ऑल्सो इनिबिटिंग द पैथोजेंस विच आर हार्मिंग अवर क्रॉप सिस्टम सो आफ्टर दिस वी हैव कम टू ऑल्सो नो द स्ट्रेसिस आर ऑल्सो वेरी प्ले एन इम्पॉर्टेंट रोल इन दैट क्रॉप सिस्टम एंड देर आर definitely they affect the adversely affect the growth of the crop and they trigger either they alter the gene expression in the plant either their cellular metabolism means they are maybe producing some different they stop producing the metabolites to combat with that particular stress or the changes in growth rate and the crop yield means because our purpose is this crop yield is very important in this case because the change of the any is means in the climate they causes the stress into the plant this is the some uh, they are the stresses biotic and abiotic stresses because in the stress condition the plants of course they try to combat with this stress but when they are plants are not able to combat with them they have to die so there are some biotic stresses means when any kind of disease comes so they will causes the stress in the plant and abiotic like in climate change and other things about uh, the some environmental means what are the stresses i will talk about the abiotic stresses the water logging drought high and low temperature excessive soil salinity inadequate minerals in soil too much or too little light because these all these stresses they are affecting the growth of the plant and the productivity also i will show you in some means in my slides the how they are affecting particularly i will talk about on water logging system means so these are the different stresses which will create any problems in the plant so in that particularly the if you see that some kind sometime it is severe severity is there sometime it is duration and the number of what is this uh, number of the exposure so this will definitely harm the system of the plant in one way or another way either they are in the organelle levels or the some other kind of stage development and some other on the uh, genotype level so in that case if it is in a severe or the, the plants is not in able to fight out with this particular kind of things so either they should develop the resistance or they have to die so there are only two kinds either they will resist or they will uh, survive i mean sir die so in that case we have to we find out which one is our organism will help now this is about the some plant response to the stress i will just uh, little bit i will tell you about that thing there are different kind of means stress temperature flooding drought and salinity and light 
they definitely is give the stress to the plant. After giving the stress to the plant, that goes into the immune system. They will work. They identify the stress. They then they will with the help of the uh, that uh, transmission, induction, or they are means they communicate to the system. Okay, how we will come back with that, and then the plant will act accordingly, and they try to system mechanism. The plant mechanism will allow to survive the plant, with, and sometimes when they are not, the leaf yellowing of leaf is take place. Sometimes means they will not. Uh, the growth of the plant will stop, and like that, there are so many. Kinds of things, so we have to be look into that matter. Now, flooding in that particular point of view, the flooding is there. So, decrease is oxygen availability of the plant roots. ATP production is lower. Survival strategies: production of enzymes for some. Uh, for sucrose, starch, degradation, glycolysis, ethanol, fermentation, ethylene, long-term acclimatization of responses, strong, uh, stem elongation. That we know very well. Even in the case of sometime, in the case of the light also, if you, if you will put a plant in the dim light, what will happen? If it is in a flowering plant, what will happen? The flowers will not come out. So flowers require a light for so that they will get energy. They will uh, make more energy so that so flowering. Because in flowering and, and in case of seeding and like that, the energy is required more. So in that particular case, when we talk about the flood, what will happen? The oxygen is less. So, if oxygen is less, you know very well what will happen because the, there will be no uh, means more energy to fight against the uh, system means means their stress, and so an ATP production is less because it, there will be no oxidation, so that way ATP it will be not released. So, in that case, that in that flooding case, stress the how we will the uh, plant will survive. So this is this uh, dramatic uh, representation that uh, from one oxygen is less, the cells will die and ethylene production is more than, then again they will target some receptors and then they will be, arenchyma will be formed, so the dead cells will be there. So this is a kind of that when it is happens in the flooding system. Now, how to mitigate the flood tolerance in soybean cropping system? Because we have isolated some pseudomonas, a potent PG pair from the rhizospheric soil. Uh, this is about the some uh, outline of analysis. Soybean is an because uh, Madhya Pradesh is a very uh, is a state of we can say a soybean state is a cash cropping system, and also we are. Uh, growing the uh, wheat also because uh, one of the uh, you have uh, heard in the uh, some uh, in the means or sorry in the TV uh, that uh, jo ka dana hai from Sihor that is called ba uh, what is called it is a uh, uh, which one do you remember Gehu Sharbati the Sharbati is from the Madhya Pradesh CEO. That is a good variety of the wheat and if you will t uh, eat it, that uh, roti of that one, you will like it very much because it is not very sweet but you will like it. So both the soybean and wheat we are producing, Madhya Pradesh is producing and also the soybean from last few years, these farmers are facing the problem of the climate change. Last year, yeah, uh, they there are too much rains was there, so m means maximum uh, I can say the fields were destroyed by this uh, flooding. So 
system. So I am having some snaps of that particular uh, study in that case. This is about all the and how this uh, PGPR that uh, will definitely help in uh, surviving of the crop. So in that field expert preparations we have this is the our uh, that we have taken the seed rate that is about that and the treatments we have used it means the control 100 percent biofertilizer means that our uh, pseudomonas and 75 uh, percent pseudomonas plus 25 percent fungicides because uh, the uh, crop will be affected by some uh, path pathogens so to avoid that one pathogens we use the uh, because these are the farmers uh, practices I am using that one that is not mine one so normally the farmers they are using but we what we have done it in that case we have used our bio, bio fertilizer not all the practices we have used only we use they are using the fungicides so we have reduced the fungicides also so that in case when we will use high amount of fungicide so definitely will harm the fertility of the soil and also it will remains in the soil so that it will harm the crop system. So 50%, 50-50 both we have taken 25 biofertilizer and 75% and 100% fungicide. In particular this case you can see the germination point of view that is the uh, seed germination you can see the more or less all the fields means treatments more or less the same but the T3 is having much effect on the germination point what is T3 is 75 percent biofertilizer and 25 percent is our fungicide so you can see the effect of the 75 percent of biofertilizer right so in that case they, you can see little means uh, the leaves are more green and plant height is little higher than in comparison to these uh, other treatments t1 t2 t3 t4 t5 t6 right now this is the you can see here this is the flooded soybean crop and this is the A part you can see it is ready this is water this is the crop and now in see in the lower second uh, photograph you can see this is the this is not our field you can see this this one is our field upper one you can see little green right and this one is the flooded one the conditions are the same but here you can see the green nest is there particularly when we talk about the not the control I am not talking about the control here you cannot see so here the treatment is there this is the T1 control after means harvesting stage so you can see the quality well, you cannot find any pots, you cannot find any seeds, they, and they, all the means plants is, don't have the green leaves, all are become yellowish. So this is the condition I want to tell you that when we will use the biofertilizer, and this biofertilizer definitely help in combating the stress and of course as we know very well when we will use the biofertilizer that biofertilizer of course the production become maybe less in comparison to when we will use the uh, chemical fertilizer urea or other means chemical fertilizer like a DAP or other things so but this 
you can see when the father the second farmer the nearby the field the farmer is using urea and other things and see the during the flood system the the plants is not very well the growth is not good maybe the, uh, the production is very less and so on so purpose is that to tell you about this plant growth promoting organism will help the our means cropping system so the farm means we will the government and as well as Welcome the others and use and other the scientists they are also recommending to use the bio fertilizer leave the chemical fertilizer but it is not possible to leave the chemical fertilizer you have to but you can minimize the quantity of chemical fertilizer so guys fertilizer is, is used use it means is need but problem, not too much amount of the fertilizer you have to go to see so the comparison you can see t1 this, uh, t2 open network sharing center then t1 t3 then the preferred internet then connection t1 and t4 uh, broadband connection t5 or ethernet and uh, so i am clicking on my broadband so, connection in all these and after this you have to click on treatment. properties you can see the after plants the properties you the growth of the plant sharing the greenish click on sharing option they are very green go and select very Lenovo good growth you can find spot and so these are this, some uh, results button of uh, after clicking on this uh, button you can you see the seed uh, germination rate see this uh, uh, that is also the see plant survival this. rate and leaf chlorophyll and click uh, okay for your damage score ignore this oil content and grain yield was analyzed in all and these treatments so you will find in t3 with the some maximum. time yes uh, this is solved and uh, close this here also the t3 is very good start your test for the particularly in uh, every aspect you Wait will find time. the t3 is There's a good amount. One hundred one thousand gram weight is maximum in See, other comparison to the other. And uh, the warning has uh, been solved. In normally, the hot uh, spot has been successfully started. After harvesting the thousand gram weight, we have video, to take it out. Please, uh, so on that basis, channel, we will uh, can we can see and, uh, that uh, the videos. production is uh, uh, very uh, good or not. Make more videos. In comparison to the guys, thanks a lot. Now the another. uh experiment that was the pseudomonas now this one is the fungus we have used that is this fungus is also uh, isolated from the medicinal plant and uh, it is a uh, uh, we have uh, done all the means uh, uh, molecular uh, identification on the on that basis it is uh, uh, we can say that is a, this is a telluromyces trichospermus and we have submitted this culture to as uh, that is a uh, fungal culture collection pune so this is our layout what we have done it in 1t1 is the absolute control seed only coated with the telcom powder no organism and other fertilizer we have not used it 100% rdf is recommended dose fertilize farmers recommend days of the farmer and 100% organic fertilizer from yard manure then t4 is the only telluromyces we have used no from yard manure no recommended dose of the farmer then telluromyces plus 75% are uh, recommended dose of then t6 is telluromyces plus 75% organic from yard manure and then t7 is the telluromyces plus 50% RDF and 50% uh, required from yard manure. This is our design. We have made the design of the uh, field experiment. You can see that is the different stages. You can see the uh, T1 R. Then other here you can see the. This is the this is the control and this is the our treatments. So, by these observations, you can flowering at after flowering stage. You can just see this is for person. 
So as you can see the, the growth and the uh, how this are flowering and other things. It is very good in particularly our treatment. So this is the pods in after 60 days and 80 days in T6 telluromyces plus organic fertilizer. So you can see the size and of the pods, number of the pods, so that by this you can easily visualize the treatment very well okay, how this our biofertilizer is working on. That is the our plant population means you can see easily this uh, T4 and T6 are the going, going uh, giving very good results. Germination in all the uh, treatments you can see the T4 and T6 of course it is good you can find and the plant height in T4 and T6 you can see the height of the plant is the maximum number of branches in you can find it in the T6 is much more in comparison to T4 Pots number in soybean, you will see that in the mud is this uh, T6 is much more than T4 and then others. Grain yield that is much higher. Is there some mis by mistake it is uh, there. And T6 or T6 in a much more higher 29.87 total. Straw yield is also good because the health, plant health is good in you will find in biofertilizer experiments. There is also a bundle yield, there is a kg per plot that is higher in the T6. So, point is to show this uh, particular uh, thing is that because this is the last year experiment, not last year sorry, a uh, few months back experiment because uh, rainy season is uh, in the from the September to it is started and number of rains was there in Madhya Pradesh and everywhere in whole India. So we got an opportunity to work on particularly uh, stress condition and natural stress. Normally what we are doing in our lab we will give the artificial stress to the plant. So we got an opportunity to work on this particular aspect and we got a good results. In that case we can say that particularly these microorganisms they are working well in natural in nature when Whatever the natural means uh, environmental conditions will be there, the microbes will not stop working because they also help the plant and they serve, means they also survive near the vicinity of the root zones so that they can provide the nutrition to the plant and they also uh, can I can say uh, they help in uh, to come out from the stress means plant to come out from the stress condition and the conclusion is like only this thing the data present shown in the yield and uh, attributes were significantly affected by the treatment use plant growth promoting microbes can play a major role in combating abiotic stress and increasing yield and they are the potential can candidates to be used as a major tool for sustainable agriculture. Lot of work is required to do also in that particular uh, conditions because that is the first experiment. We have done it, we have to repeat two to three more times to see that what is really our organism is working or not because we want sometimes microorganisms lose their properties in due course of time. So we have to see 
whether it is whether the organism is sustainable to work in the field or not and once again i'm thankful to the organizers for giving an opportunity to show my presentation here to discuss to how uh, to tell about myself what i am doing in this particular field i'm thankful to the organizer particularly the minu saraf who is in, invited me here thank you very much very nice discussion ha huh, if there is some questions uh, we can take few questions no problem
possibilities and particularly how this microorganism work in the flood system. So that we have to be checked out. Thank you. Uh, sir, my name is Dr. Uh, I was wondering for how many days uh, the flood was there, the water was there in the fields? Uh, the flood was uh, normally is about uh, 10 to 15 days. 10? Okay, great. So that's what I was wondering. Yeah. It is a long period it, it because it, uh, in, in particular in Madhya Pradesh, 7 days it continuously is raining. Because if it is a quick one, hard for 2 yeah. days. And it is not two days. So that's a good thing. Very good thing. Uh, my surprise, Tamil Vedan, Prosumai, this is my part. Uh, so I have more others because I am coming from Madrid Chandras. Uh, I feel so happy to know that most of the conventional universities are doing work on Madrid Chandras. Things going on like that, we don't have any work. That is the motive of this conference. <laughs> Uh, forced to do work on agriculture <laughs> because uh, agriculture field is available, so it will be. Yeah. Uh, another thing is that whenever we go for uh, this type of uh, experiments, so I mean with uh, biofertilizer, we should apply rhizobium as a basic thing because that is uh, go hand in hand. We shouldn't avoid that rhizobium. Uh, whenever you go any type of treatment, it should be there because it's a recommendation. Yeah. So it has to be added in your treatment. Okay. That is very Thank important. You. Thank you. And we have a, a soybean system, rhizobium right now. Okay. In all the department, you can get it. And you can have to add in your treatment should Okay. That is very important. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So definitely we will use it. Okay. As a My Myself, Dr. Harsha Sobhi. I have a different type of question, sir, which I am uh, facing when I am actually working in the field. Uh, we do all these things or we can apply biofertilizers, but how do we deal with infestations of insects? Because uh, infestation is also a problem. Insects do come and damage the crops. So our experimental sector is also doing and uh, all this means application of biofertilizers and the concept also goes, it doesn't actually suffice the experiment. So is there any way how we can deal with insecticides? Organic farming, when we practice organic farming, infestation was a problem with me. Uh, vegetables and fruits, so we never got enough uh, productivity to justify the cost. So this was a problem with what, what I faced in the field. Uh, regarding that, because we have not uh, saw any means at this time, because we are not working on the insect. But uh, my, I am also th thinking of that to work on this insect, because uh, insect attack is also a stress to the plant. Natural and uh, particularly this Tenderomyces striatus firmus is an endo uh, pathogenic uh, fungi, and uh, I will use this particular kind of uh, uh, organism and see the because we uh, at present in Bhopal means particularly we don't have a, a person who is working on insects, so we have to go somewhere else. So if somebody is interested to work on that. I can provide the culture because because in providing the culture is not not a big because I am also not going to patent that culture. Just because to because if I will patent, it will not reach to the farmers. So my purpose that my organism should reach to the uh, laymen also, laymen farmers, so they can use it in a better manner. If they will purchase it, then the things will be different. So my point is that. If somebody wants to work at only I want, if they want, they acknowledge us, or if they don't, then don't. So only it means if they want to work on it, they can work on it. There is no problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Any? You want to ask anything? Okay, thank you. So we thank Professor Anil Prakash for such an informative and discussion provoking talk on this topic. Uh, I would like to announce that for this kind of discussion and for brainstorming Tomorrow, 12 to 1.30, we are keeping a 
discussion forum and there all of us will be together will exchange the thoughts and then we will try to extract out something new where it can practice the agriculture for the betterment of mankind here in India. Thank you all. Now we are joining for lunch and the second session will be after one hour.